The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. Hi there, and welcome to Sonic Society episode 480. You know, next season we're having a party at 500. I think we definitely have to, yes. Are you coming to mine or shall I come to yours? <laughs> oh my goodness. Let's do both. Let's yes. just go across the continents. We're your host, Jack Ward, with none other than... David Alt. Hello, everyone. Hello. It's the end of season 11. It's been I quite know. a year. It has. Any thoughts on the season past, David? Well, um, we've had an awful lot of fantastic audio drama. And I know there's some that I have then gone on to uh, to listen to afterwards. Like, so we had the adventures of Felix Trench, didn't we? The yes. diminutive detective, and they awesome. that was fantastic. And I've then went and looked at what else that group had done. They've done Wooden Overcoats, oh. which is an audio drama about two different funeral directors on one small island. Uh, they've just finished their Kickstarter to fund season two, so I'm very much looking forward to that. Oh wow! No. I- I'll have to go back and listen to that myself. I didn't notice that one. That's great. Yeah, it's been really good. And otherwise, in the, in the season, it's been fun to do discussions before the shows. I've enjoyed that. Yes. And getting in touch with you a little bit more often than we <laughs> used to. That's right. Sort of throw you the <laughs> script and this is what you got to do and then send it back yep. and then not have a chance to talk much at all. <laughs> yeah, it's been a little yes. more relaxed that way. I know that for me, the big thing that I've noticed is sort of the rise of podcast fiction. I call them pod fix. Yeah. You know, the, the black yep. tapes, the message was huge this mm-hmm. year. Brand mm-hmm. new out of there. I don't know if they'll come back with a second season. Sounds like they rounded that one up pretty close. Tannis I've been Mm -hmm. enjoying Mm -hmm. and of course Serial Season 2 finished off as well Serial Season 2 is a little more of a docudrama I don't know it's 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 sort of realistic documentary I think I think it is actually it's a real case isn't it that they were looking at the other ones are all fiction based so but Uh, yeah yeah Mm -hmm. but it's interesting because it has like that whole serial breakthrough has really brought people to audio drama but a very different style in this kind Mm. of almost like you know here we are talking about what's going on and now I'm going to play a little clip of what I had an interview of before kind of thing, which mm. you would think would be more of an interview show, but because it's scripted, it still ends up being an interesting kind of audio drama story that you walk through. Yes, absolutely. And we've also seen a lot of found footage and other s- such things, mm-hmm. uh, such as uh, Archive 81 I've been listening to, which is a, a strange mystery horror set around someone keeping the records for a building in New York City. That that was that's one that I've I've been listening to recently. A small town horror, yes, also very good. The No Sleep podcast just continues to go from strength to strength. That's now in uh, the its seventh season, fifth year. Wow, it's continuing to move. And so yeah, I think we are really experiencing quite a renaissance For sure of uh, of audio drama. We had brand new shows from Audio Oblivious, uh, mm-hmm. uh, which was great, and that continues. Well, we had old shows that were given to us for Day of the Martians. Another look at at yep. the War of the Worlds series. Mm-hmm. We had, of course, Strangeness in Space yes. come with us. Yes, we did. Uh, which was great. Uh, we Dream Realm Enterprise has come back after so many years. Uh, Sandbox Radio Live. Some episodes of The Grist Mill I found that mm-hmm. I got a chance to put on and show. And of course, Technical Difficulty Supercut that he oh, did. Oh yes, which that was, was just brilliant. So much fun. I yep. even had a uh, message from Peter Lutz who wanted me to point out that he is indeed coming with one of uh, the new Sonic Summerstock players playhouse shows but oh, good. he he sent me a message in facebook he said do you know this guy kai and chris Con- he's amazing <laughs> went, welcome yes. to the party pal yeah we've known this for a while so uh there was the hum of course there was more pulp Puri theater from pete lutz which was great he yes. won some awards mark time awards which mm-hmm. was awesome so there was just been and many many more we had bells in the bat free return oh bells in the bat free return how could i forget yes. john bell returned that was fantastic just a wonderful year of mm. 
of people who had pod faded and had returned as well as uh, people who are brand new and up and coming. So we're very excited. Mm-hmm. Very excited. Hadron Gospel Hour was brand new and exciting and huge as well. Mm. We also had a fantastic series from uh, Ontario, from Toronto, Ontario, comedian, and it was called... Uh, Alba Salix, wasn't it? Alba Salix, absolutely. Yeah, wonderful. So again, brand new radio drama. What's going to happen next year? That's the thing I love about this series, that what I love about being like the showcase of radio drama from around the world is we get to hear so many neat things that take us so that we can see how this medium has grown and, Mm. and... how many people keep coming to it? It's wonderful. It is brilliant. And uh, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing what happens. Yes. I wonder where we're going to go from here and what's going to happen. There's always, you know, concerns that we're going to be shut down because podcasting is going to be cut off for one reason or another. Or Ooh, it's going to have to go to a paid model. Now. No. Yeah, well, there's, nah. there's, there's the patent trolls that keep, you know, creeping their heads up saying, well, they created uh, podcasting before and they'll have to charge people. And that seems to never pan out. So let's hope that that remains... <sighs> I, I think free. all of that kind of stuff, if someone tried to charge mm-hmm. for the idea of podcasting, there, there are so many podcasts out there right now. Right. It would be a, a little bit like knitting smoke. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I can't imagine them being able to <laughs> to, no. to get a hold of anybody. <laughs> well, tonight, you know, we finished our season 11, and it's free of charge with another new audio drama company and audio series, Liberty Audio. Producer Travis Vengroff has sent us a couple of episodes. I can't wait to get them on the air. Oh, I love Liberty. I, I, I follow it all the time, so it's these are good. Wonderful. So without further ado, Liberty Audio presents right here on the Sonic Society. Welcome, citizen, to the first episode of the Liberty Critical Research Podcast, brought to you by the Nerdy Show Podcast Network. As your media director, it is my duty to inform you that the following story may contain content some listeners may find disturbing. This podcast has been labeled explicit and is intended for mature audiences. If you feel that at any point you are uncomfortable with the presented media, please terminate your broadcast. Otherwise, stay tuned and remember, Atreus endures. following message to Dr. Octavius Ayev upon arrival to the terminal. I apologize, Dr. Ayev, but I will not be in today. I was summoned elsewhere, but I forwarded my research to your desk so that you can look over it at your convenience. System 5 is still running my latest model. The results should be available in a few hours. End of message. Recording ended. Audio message saved. We have arrived at Station 10, District 4. Please disembark for Station 10. Next stop is Station 11, District 4. If you want to reach Station 17, please disembark at this time and take the B Sky Rail to Station 17 in District 9. Thank you for using the Sky Rail system.
message to Dr. Octavius Aya has been sent. Welcome, Dr. Kofsky. Please continue down the hall. Are you Mrs. Tongs? Yes. Thank you for your timely appearance, Dr. Kofsky. I know that our contacting you was unexpected, but we believe we may have what you may consider a great opportunity ahead of us. Please, follow me. We've been following your work for quite some time, Dr. Kofsky. Not many people are interested in the lighter side of theoretical fringe or model interpretations. Well, not many people belong to our division. Might I ask to which division you're referring? Today you may, Dr. Kofsky. We here at the Division of Fringe Relations have taken quite an interest in your recent work. I'm surprised to hear this, on both accounts. The existence of the DFR would have been vastly influential to my work. In fact, I'm not sure how my findings could be of any use to you, as I imagine the DFR has far greater resources available than I've had during my research. Well, the accuracy of your models, given your lack of information, is actually what we find so impressive. Accuracy? You've made great strides. We believe your models have an approximate 70% accuracy in the best of cases. Although this seems low, this is an astonishing achievement. We have been browsing your files and noticed that your multiple applications to excursions to the fringe were denied. I assure you, my work would be more accurate with first-hand research. This is what we expect, Dr. Kowski. That's why you're here. I'm sorry, what do you... Why am I here? The DFR believes that you have potential. We want to give you the opportunity to advance your research. And we know that as you progress, so too shall Atreus. My research can only continue with additional information. If the division were to provide it, I could possibly gain five, maybe seven percent accuracy. Your thinking is limited, Dr. Kowski. We believe a direct approach is the best course of action. We want you to lead an expedition into the fringe. Uh... Your transfer was immediate, and as of 0800 hours, you are now an official resource of the Division of Fringe Relations. You no longer report to Dr. Ayev, and your current assignment commences now. What about my lab? Your lab consisted of a single desk in an overcrowded room, and your research has been at a standstill since we have released no new information to the public on fringe or social construction in the past two decades. Future research will depend on this division. And now on you, Dr. Kowski. When do I start? You already have, and we have a briefing prepared. Assuming you formally accept the new position. This is the best opportunity I have to better Atreus. All the work I've completed in the theoretical social engineering of fringer populations could be validated, or invalidated, by even a small excursion. I'll interpret that as your acceptance. Please continue this way, Dr. Kowski. So, I'm formally a member of the DFR. As stated earlier, Dr. Kowski, your previous employment has already been terminated. Hmm. There are a lot of stories about this place. Most of them are true, Dr. Kowski. <laughs> Where do we keep the secret army? Underground. We have more space there. <laughs> this way, Dr. Kowski. I'd like to introduce you to Miss Ponset and Dr. Fan. They are the internal directors of your operation. Everything so far has been planned by them, and soon we will be entrusting all of their hard work to you. Please be seated, Dr. Kowski. Greetings. Hello. Hi. We know that the shift to the DFR has been expedient, but now that the planning is complete, we are all ready to continue with haste. As Mrs. Tongs has hopefully informed you, you will be leading the expedition into the fringe. Specifically sectors 2-5 and 3-5 of the southern fringe. We've had some recent reconnaissance from the northern sectors, but our information on the south is limited. Tribes, or gangs, have been forming at an alarming rate, matching several of your predictions. We believe that your inclusion of variable resource scarcity and your background in psychological health make you an ideal candidate. Thankfully, the high number, instead of high size of these gangs, has limited their actions thus far, but Director Preston would like to take a more preemptive approach and has allocated us the resources to do so. So, will I be leading the Northern team into a Southern expedition? They are... indisposed. You will have your own team. Officers from the Special Defense Force will assist you in your mission and ensure your safety. They have a basic understanding of your objective, but I would not rely on them for assistance on academic matters. We expect that you will be in the fringe for at least a few weeks, and as such, you will be given appropriate supplies. We are looking for any and all information available. Symbologies, possible culture, social structure, 
intergroup relations, economic activities, mindsets, and, of course, assessing the military threat these fringers pose to Atreus, if any. It sounds as though you already have the entire mission planned. We do, and your final report will be called an ethnographic investigation of the tribes and activities of the Southern Fringe. Hmm, that's nice to know. You joke, but this is a very dangerous excursion. My apologies. I, I understand the gravity of the situation. Do you? These sub creatures are more vile, untrustworthy, and dangerous than anything the Department of Public Affairs is allowed to broadcast. Your research has been vastly limited because the information at your disposal has been tamed, censored, and made suitable for public access. We could never send you out prepared. This is true. You'll notice that the primitive fringers you see on broadcast differ greatly from the ones you'll encounter which are capable of speech and higher thinking. That's why my models worked. I always assumed that over time, given their social cohesion, they must have developed some form of speech or communication, which is indicative of higher thinking. Precisely, but don't mistake higher thinking for civility. Would I be correct in assuming that neither of you will be joining me on the mission? You will be the only science officer on this mission. Studies have shown that smaller groups are more likely to go unnoticed. In addition, to better assure your safety, you and your team will be outfitted in the guise of fringers. What sort of reports have you gotten from the Northern team? We prefer audio or audio-visual logs and the occasional digital notes when applicable or more viable. This data will need to be stored on your person until a dead drop is reached. Otherwise, you are responsible for the safety of your research as well. Keep in mind that we have a few agents that are currently operating within the fringe. If you encounter such an agent, they may be of assistance. That's not exactly what I meant. We cannot give you specific information we deem unneeded for your mission. Okay. What information do you deem needed for my mission? Do not eat anything that does not come from a sealed meal canister and boil any water before consumption. In particular, social situations. You may be required to de-emphasize your status and allow the soldiers to project the illusion of leadership. Fringers value physical superiority far more than Atrians. A physically weak leader is generally deemed abnormal, and this would draw attention to your party. You might be seen as a prize, someone with a useful skill that can be claimed by a tribe. Anything else? That's all for now. You'll be meeting the members of your team immediately. But before you do so, we'd like to give you this. A recording device? Starting today, we would like you to keep your audio or audio-visual notes regarding your mission on this device at regular intervals, as you will not be able to bring your privacy hood with you into the fringe. We will dismiss your audio recording today as practice, but we will need you to make a log for the day as you're officially on DFR allocation. You can make the log on the way to Sector 11. We will be meeting your team there. When do we leave? Now. Reven doors. Reven doors. May your research benefit Atreus. How do I turn this thing on? Oh, it's recording. Um... You're holding it upside down. Thank you. So, my name is Dr. Marta Lukowski of the Department of Research and Div... The Department of Special Services, Division of Fringer Relations. We know that. You're going to have to state the time and date at the start of each recording. We need to be able to put your excursion in clear chronological order. Right. Um, <clears throat> today is the first day of the fifth month in the year 709. It is exactly 9.22, and today I have been introduced to my new position as the lead science officer of the Southern Fringe Excursion. I was selected for this position because of my previous research in the fields of social engineering and psychological health, specifically as it relates to my most recent work in theoretical Fringer model interpretations. I am to be fitted for my new assignment and introduced to my new team shortly. We are currently traveling to an undisclosed location in Sector 11, and it's a bit dark down here. <sighs> On a personal note, as a psychological health professional, I believe I'm uncomfortable in the dark. You'll have to resolve that, Dr. Koski. It is also my professional opinion that Mrs. Tongs really likes my name. Or maybe just names. Perhaps it helps her remember them better. As I was saying, this change in my life is entirely unprecedented and it is the most exciting and frightening thing to have ever happened to me. I am optimistic that I will live up to the standards put forth by the Division and that my research will benefit Atreus as a whole. 
We've all heard the stories of the Fringe, and hearing that it's somehow worse than my worst imaginings is, admittedly, unnerving. I've been informed by the directors of my operation that I will be assigned a protective entourage consisting of Special Defense Force officers. As our numbers are expected to be few, even this does not put my fears at ease. I would never turn down such an opportunity, but for posterity, I'd like to state that I'm still hesitant. I'm excited, I'm scared, and I'm proud. And I'm slightly confused as to how long these audio logs have to be. Uh, this okay, Mrs. Tongs? Yes, that will be fine, Dr. Kofsky. I am Dr. Martalukovsky with the DFS, and I like the sound of that. Thank you for listening to the Liberty Podcast. Episode 1 of Liberty Critical Research was written by Caitlin Statz and co-created and produced by Travis Vengroff. The voice of Dr. Martalukovsky was Paul Maya. Mrs. Tongs and Oriella Stolo were Caitlin Statz. Miss Paulsette was Caitlin Sanzo, and Dr. Fawn was special guest David Cummings. David Cummings is the producer of the No Sleep Podcast. If you enjoy horror audio fiction, check out the No Sleep Podcast, available on iTunes. The music and sound for this broadcast were recorded and designed by Careless Juja. If you have enjoyed listening to Liberty Critical Research, please rate and review us on iTunes, or like and follow us on SoundCloud. If you would like more information about the world of Atreus, please visit thelibertycomic.com, sign up for our digital newsletter, or like us on Facebook. This podcast is presented by the Nerdy Show Network. All Nerdy Show programming is made possible by Orlando's number one comic stop, a comic shop, and through the support of our listeners. To support the Nerdy Show Network and its presentations, please consider contributing to the Patreon at patreon.com slash nerdyshow and visiting nerdyshow.com for other works. This production is copyright 2015 by John Dossinger Publishing, and Liberty is a trademark of Travis Van Groff. Thank you for listening, and may the Archon watch over you. Welcome, citizen, to the second episode of the Liberty Critical Research Podcast, brought to you by the Nerdy Show Podcast Network. As your media director, it is my duty to inform you that the following story may contain content some listeners may find disturbing. This podcast has been labeled explicit and is intended for mature audiences. If you feel that at any point you are uncomfortable with the presented media, please terminate your broadcast. Otherwise, stay tuned and remember, Atreus endures. District 11 being so far away. Do you walk much, Dr. Kovsky, or do you simply take the sky rail? Hmm. Welcome to our District 11 facility, Dr. Kovsky. While you will not be here long, the information we pick up from your dead drops will be collected and stored here. As you probably understand, the DFR operates with the utmost security and discretion. So, sadly, many of our facilities are underground. So, is this the facility with the secret underground army? No, Dr. Kovsky. Not this one, but your military outfit is located here. After all, this is a small facility. Degenerate. Stealing my pumpkin? I told you I wanted pumpkin. Well, you're getting chicken. Everyone else here loves pumpkin just as much as you do. Even Tongs. Right, Tongs? It's Mrs. Tongs, Officer Jalo. Hey, Tongs. Mm. Tongs, maybe you can help settle this. I called dibs in the pumpkin. Now they're telling me that I have to have chicken. They say it's not fair because I had pumpkin this morning. But I was the first one awake. They could have had pumpkin if they woke up as early as I did and completed nearly as much work. Dr. Kovsky, this is your protective entourage. Officers, please introduce yourselves to Dr. Kovsky. So this is science man? Officer Severus Jungfist, close quarters. Officer Decima Jalo, pointman. Officer Cato Patel, interface specialist. Senior investigator Gradius Rodriguez, combat medic with previous experience working in the fringe. Okay, I guess that's fine. Uh, hi. I'm Dr. Martal Okovsky. I work in the fields of social engineering and psychological health. I'm glad to know I'll have a talented team. Watching my back? And front? And sides? We will be having a special briefing with information provided by Senior Investigator Rodriguez at 1000 hours. 
All of you should finish eating before the briefing. Pumpkin or no pumpkin, Officer Jungquist. Can we interest you in any meal, Doctor? We've got everything. Chocolate included. Don't worry, it's not our ration. It's stock from this facility. Sure. I'll have a tofu. Oh, living large, are we? Nervous stomach. Sweet, sour, salty, savory. Mm. You seem like the savory sort. Catch. Thanks. So, Cato, did you hear? Long's West is starting his own monthly broadcast. What's it going to be about? Not sure. Ads for it are pretty vague. I don't see why people like that kid so much. I mean, what... What does he actually do? Well, he was born to the West family. Did anyone hear how much that new privacy hood is supposed to cost? Yeah, about three months' pay. Unless you're a close quarters specialist. I'm not buying it. I was just curious. They'll probably be debugging it for at least a year. <laughs> yeah, never buy those things at launch. So, um... So I was curious. Have any of you been out there before? Rodriguez has. Not many people are assigned to the fringe, and fewer come back. That's why we've got Rodriguez. And weapons. And you. You speak their language or something, right? Uh... Dr. Kofsky has made great strides in the field of theoretical social engineering of fringer populations. Theoretical? I assure you that Dr. Kofsky is the best in his field. But enough talk. Senior Investigator Rodriguez, would you begin the briefing? Tomorrow, we will be outfitting ourselves to appear as fringers before leaving through an access tunnel into the southern fringe. Dr. Kofsky and Officer Jalo are still required at this time to receive the dual citizen mark, which will be taken care of following this briefing. When we exit the tunnel and finally arrive in the southern fringe, it is my personal recommendation that we begin by moving southeast. But this is to the discretion of Dr. Kofsky and what he believes is best for the mission. During the duration of the mission, it is my recommendation that inter-party communication is maintained at a minimal level of volume so your unique accent is not noticed by fringers, which would draw attention. Are any fringer accent audio recordings available? No. Additionally, I recommend that we elect an individual within our unit to appear as the leader of our group that isn't Dr. Kofsky. I recommend Jungfist or myself based on stature alone, as stature means more to fringers than you would suspect. Sorry, Jungfist. No offense taken. I'm voting for Rodriguez as well. Do you know their accent, Rodriguez? There are literally hundreds of local dialects. I'm very familiar with three or four and can reproduce them when needed. Could you say something for us right now, Infringer? I'm serious. Perhaps after the briefing. Furthermore, I suggest keeping all valuables like meal, water canisters, and operational equipment out of sight. I also strongly advise against taking anything with you that you don't mind getting stolen, broken, or that would attract attention. You're going to see things in the fringe, indecent things. Though every cell in your body will wish to help prevent some of the atrocities we are set to witness, know that we cannot. Just remind yourself that these are not people. They're fringers. Creatures incapable of altruism, trust, or compassion. It is common to see fringers eating fringers. A severed foot has the worth of pork. While they are violent, attacks generally occur only when they are provoked. Provoking can include stepping into the wrong place at the wrong time, doing the wrong thing around the wrong individuals, having the wrong things in the right place, saying the wrong thing in general, and looking like an easy target. The rules are many. For instance, eye contact is generally bad outside of a building, but only within certain groups. Symbolism is more important than you ever thought before. An empty bullet casing embedded in a doorway means that the room is probably occupied by violent raiders who don't want to be bothered. Most of my knowledge is limited to the eastern fringe, so there will undoubtedly be variants, which is what we're there to document. Another thing to take note of will be the constant changes in pressure and temperature. Unlike Atreus, the fringe does not have constant regional atmospheric control. These changes can make you dizzy, make you vomit, cause nosebleeds, and make your ears pop. You might not know what make your ears pop means just yet, but I can promise you that it's only a mild discomfort associated with atmospheric pressure changes. I regret that I am unable to give you additional information, as the fringe is vastly inconsistent and varied even on a local level. <clears throat> Are there any additional questions? Will we move in standard formation? I would strongly advise against it. So, if feet are pork, what's pumpkin? I've seen them do some rather fancy things with intestines. What is the easiest way to identify a threat, and do we have an interpersonal signal for when to engage diplomatically versus combatively? First, everything in the fringe is either capable of fighting or is closely guarded by such. 
Second, we should establish words that indicate an upcoming conflict or some form of immediate danger in a given situation. In the past, I've used a scale of sweet, savory, salty, and sour. Sweet means diplomatic, sliding up to sour, which means everything is about to hit the gutter. You'll find that with Fringer dialect, these words can easily be slipped into a sentence. Are there any particularly obvious cultural taboos? While our upcoming mission will give us this information, I found that in the Eastern Fringe, they tend to hate Atrians, so don't compromise our origin. Respect is also very important to Fringers. If you have the opportunity to be respectful, shy of a salute, I found that small pleasantries do well to avoid unnecessary conflict. How can we show respect to these... these aberrations? You simply view them as a series of exploitable commodities. If we scare them off or aggravate them too much, we will not be able to get the information we require. We need to hear the accent. We need to be able to talk to these people. I can't be expected to interview them if I'm not even permitted to talk with them. I just drop extra words in your speech here, punk ass. I need to sound like that? Also, try not to use any words that contain more than three syllables or the word fringer. They generally identify themselves based on a gang affiliation or a similar local tie. When is it appropriate to use words like punk? They typically don't use derogatory slang when speaking with someone of importance, but it's fairly common when dealing with comrades. How do I say, explain to me your intergroup social structure? Who's a boss? And who's his boss? And perhaps, you do a night with those guys? Hmm. I'm gonna die. Dr. Kovsky, Officer Jalo, please come with me. We need to outfit you with the dual citizen mark. I can, uh, speak a, a fringe language. That was perfect. So you're point man. What's that entail? It means I'm great at being quiet. And I've got the best eyes in Atreus. Please place your hand into the machine, Dr. Kovsky. This will hurt a little. Ow! Big baby. (sighs) Officer Jalo? See? It wasn't that painful. The swelling should subside in four to six hours. So that's it. I'm officially in Fringer Relations. If anyone wants me to bring any messages to your respective family, co-workers, or friends, please record them now, as I will be departing within the hour. Just give you my data pad once I'm done? No, I actually just purchased one of those new Zhao privacy hoods. Just transfer them to me via the shortwave. There's no password or encryption yet. Excellent. Here's a few pre-recorded messages. Don't send the ones marked farewell, though. Unless I... don't come back. I also pre-recorded my message. I didn't do a farewell one, though. I guess it doesn't really matter. I've just got the one file, but it's pretty big. Wow, that was pretty quick. That Zhao, genius. As this was unexpected, I still need to record mine. Is there anywhere more private? You can use the lavatory, Dr. Kofsky. All right, thanks. Command, create audiovisual recording message for family. Starting audiovisual recording of message for family. Hey everyone, Mom, Dad, Luca, um, I wanted to inform you that I unexpectedly made a great breakthrough in my work, or at least I will be very soon. Because of this, my department has asked that I rem- uh, that I- well, I can't really tell you, but I'll be absent for a few weeks, or more. This thing that's going on is exciting and terrifying at the same time. I've got a new thing I'm working on with a new team. They seem interesting and friendly. Yeah, I think I'll like working with them. I will not be able to receive any communications during my research period, so please don't send any messages. I know I haven't seen you in a while, but know that I'm thinking of you. When I return, I'll have a great cause for celebration, and I'd like to take you out to the central city for drinks. My treat. Remember the time we celebrated Victory Day at that bar near Jacob West Park? It'll be like that. Only we won't give Luca quite so much alcohol. (laughs) Well, that's all I can really say at the moment. I just wanted to let you know that I miss you. May the Archon watch over you. All of you. Recording ended. Audio-visual message saved. Command. Send the message to interface Tongs. Message sent to Tongs. Thank you all for your time. I'll be sure these messages reach their intended destination. May the Archon watch over you. Bye, Tongs. So, now what? 
You're in control of the operation, but I suggest that we use what little time we have improving your fringer speak. That would be useful. Let's do that. Damn it, Junkvist! Put down that pumpkin! I had it first, it's mine. <laughs> Today is still the first day of the fifth month in the year 709. It is nearing 2700 hours. I met my protective detail today. They seem like an interesting collective. Officer Jungfist is something of a jester, but he and Officer Patel are overall pleasant. Officer Jalo is... determined, and I'm glad she'll be watching over us. Best eyes in Atreus, she says, and little seems to escape her. Investigator Rodriguez is difficult to explain. Unless it pertains to the mission, he finds little need to talk. I feel as though he's the only one who fully understands what we're getting ourselves into. This morning I thought I was waking up to theoretical models, so the gravity of the situation still has yet to impact me. I'm too afraid to admit to everyone that I'm afraid. <clears throat> Investigator Rodriguez told us some horror stories during the briefing, and Officer Jalo brought up a valid concern. How can we even begin to question something so vastly different from anything we've experienced? On a personal note, I feel as though I made a mistake. I squandered what may have been my final opportunity to speak to my family. I know that I didn't expect this, but my final recording was inadequate. There's so much more I wish I could have said. It was far too casual. If these records are ever released to the public, Mom, Dad, Luca, sorry about the inadequate message. I love you very much, and we should share meals more often. I, I mean, have dinner more often. <laughs> Sorry, official guy that has to listen to all these logs. These are going to get personal. Thank you for listening to the Liberty Podcast. Episode 2 of Liberty Critical Research was written by Caitlin Statz and co-created and produced by Travis Van Groff. The voice of Dr. Marta Lukowski was Paul Maya. Mrs. Tongs and Oriella Stolo were Caitlin Statz. Kato Patel was Brian Keller. Decima Jalo was Lauren Griffin. Severus Jungquist was Travis Van Groff and Gradius Rodriguez was John Carter. The music and sound for this broadcast were recorded and designed by Careless Juja. If you have enjoyed listening to Liberty Critical Research, please rate and review us on iTunes, or like and follow us on SoundCloud. If you would like more information about the world of Atreus, please visit thelibertycomic.com, sign up for our digital newsletter, or like us on Facebook. This podcast is presented by the Nerdy Show Network. All Nerdy Show programming is made possible by Orlando's number one comic stop, a comic shop, and through the support of our listeners. To support the Nerdy Show Network and its presentations, please consider contributing to the Patreon at patreon.com slash nerdyshow and visiting nerdyshow.com for other works. This production is copyright 2015 by John Dossinger Publishing, and Liberty is a trademark of Travis Van Groff. Thank you for listening, and may the Archon watch over you. Welcome, citizens, to Liberty, Tales from the Tower, brought to you by the Nerdy Show Podcast Network. As your media director, it is my privilege to inform you that the following stories will contain content some listeners will certainly find disturbing. But first, we here at Tower 4 have a few special announcements. We'd like to thank everyone who's donated to the Liberty Deception Kickstarter so far. We're just over halfway to our goal, but it's still rather a daunting task. If you have the opportunity, please pledge your support today and get all the latest updates, art, and help shape the very future of Atreus. A quick update on critical research. Our team has written the script for the first four episodes, which are already longer than the script for the entire first season. So you could almost say that we've written just as much as season one already, though we still have quite a ways to go. The Liberty Creative Team has also created a Twitter account, at Atreus Endures. Additionally, we'd like to remind everyone in Tower 17 of District 11 that maintenance workers from the GOPTM will be doing extensive repairs and calibrations throughout all floors of the tower, following yesterday's fire. The cause of the fire is unknown, but by tonight, the gravity, oxygen levels, pressure, and temperature should be returned to their normal levels. On the topic of normalcy, it's easy to overlook the small things that make up your daily routine. For instance, a misplaced data pad or an odd elevator ride can certainly undermine the normal feel of life. Floor None was written by Caitlin Statz, 
and is read for us by Sean Francis. So let's get started. After several years playing fetch for an interior decorating team, I gratefully accepted the new position as the interdepartmental courier for a new research division of GOPTM. The selected floors of a particularly damaged tower in District 9 had been rebuilt, renovated, and modified over the last few months to suit the needs of the new set of research and testing units. The majority of the other workers were already in place everything from managing research leads to janitorial staff, but a couple of additions were overlooked at the beginning. The courier job was one, thankfully. About a week into the job, I was extremely happy with the new position. I was responsible for delivering items between labs, floors, and even buildings within the district. It was a big upgrade from carting strange sculptures and furniture across the city. My new job feels much more meaningful after being entrusted with these more important objects. In the middle of my second week, I was running a whole queue of interlaboratory packages from one floor to another. Floor 8 had a whole cart piled carefully with objects to be delivered up to floor 19. A rather nonchalant green-garbed researcher signed over the cart to me, and I headed off with the loaded trolley toward the floor lobby. I passed the recreation hall on the way out and stopped in to take a quick drink. Inside sat a few of the floor 8 lab workers near the end of the shift, taking time to catch up on their day. Octavia was seated across from the door and greeted me upon arrival. She's a wonderful woman, very friendly and talkative. She walked over to me following my arrival. How are you, Festus? She poured me a tin of water. I am so happy my shift is nearly over. This place really disturbs me this late in the evening. Disturbs? This made no sense, as the whole building was a perfectly functional, clean, and diligently patrolled set of science labs. Yes, it makes me feel so... very... uneasy. Sorry, I can't really explain it. Flavia and Tertius also get the same feeling. Have you? She sipped her drink. Do you get the same feeling, I mean? No, not really. I really quite like the new renovation aesthetic. Very clean. I downed the drink and pondered that perhaps she was simply accustomed to the general dilapidated nature of District 9, but my thoughts were interrupted by the beeping of my data pad. The delivery queue was awaiting confirmation. Well, I guess not everyone does. Have a productive day. I'll see you tomorrow, perhaps, Festus? May the Archon watch over you. She stirred a drink and walked back to the table. I nodded and turned the courts around, heading out the door. When I got to the lobby, the place was empty, but one of the elevator doors was already open and vacant, so I carefully wheeled the cart into the lift. As I pushed the cart, the front wheel stuck at the edge of the elevator platform and unbalanced several pieces from the front of the cart. Fully in the lift, I scrabbled forward to catch and adjust the falling equipment as the door slid shut. With everything finally back in place, and a few mumbled curses, I reached out for the indicator for floor 19. As I reached for the panel, I found a distinct lack of buttons, or a panel. The door was already shut, and the elevator jostled slightly as it began to move. Confused, I had looked for a service button of any kind and found nothing. I was in some sort of maintenance or private elevator with a preset destination, and I awkwardly waited for my arrival. Some of the more private floors had specific elevators, and I grew anxious of my job's security as I approached what I suspected might be an angered supervisor. When the elevator finally stopped, I noticed that I did not know whether I had traveled up or down, seeing as I had spent most of my time stressing over all possible excuses to avoid a firing scenario. When the door chimed open, I tried my best to form a casual smile while waiting for the chastising words of security personnel. 
but no one was there. The door slid open with a silent glide, and before me was a plain hallway, void of angry or armed peoples. Relieved, I stepped outside the elevator and pulled the cart out of the elevator behind me. I paid careful attention to the stacked objects this time as I passed it over the ridge. It was fine, and I checked the outside of the door for a floor number indicator, but to no avail. Additionally, the door slid silently closed as I was inspecting the hallway, and I only leapt toward it after my attempt was certainly futile. The elevator closed, and as far as I could see, there was no call button. With the elevator door closed, I stood in the hallway in silence. There were two doors on the left wall and two on the right, as well as another at the end of the hall. It was a relatively short section of hall, and the doors were rather close to each other, which led me to believe they were storage closets or offices instead of labs like most other floors. I checked my data pad for the internal signal, finding that not even a message could go in or out. Regardless, I typed up a message to my supervisor and to Octavia in the hopes it would go out when the signal connected. Stuck on private floor, can't call the elevator, please locate. I stood there for what I assumed was five minutes in absolute silence. It was an awkward feeling, like running late to a course as a student, yet not wanting to go in and acknowledge you were late. So after several minutes of silently standing, I walked over to the nearest door on the left and knocked lightly. Uh, hello, this is the Interdivisional Courier. Did you request a package pickup? I lied. It was a defense mechanism. They couldn't be overly angered with me for just trying to do my job. No response led me to try that same thing with the first door on the right. But when no one responded again, I wondered if this floor was even meant to be in operation. With the new labs moving into the building, there may be some floors, or at least some sections of floor, that were still unassigned or without use. Since this thought did not help my stress regarding being stuck on a floor without an elevator call, I tried the next door. This is the interdivisional courier. Did you request a package pickup? At which point, after no reply, I tried opening the door. It was securely locked. I walked around my cart, which was placed in the middle of the hallway at this point, and tried the last door on the left wall. The moment I placed my knuckles against the door, a great scream launched itself from the door at the end of the hall. The voice of a woman screamed a dreadful howl and yelled in a terrified panic for help again and again, its voice penetrating through the door. I rushed over to the door at the end of the hallway and shoved it open as quickly as possible. Unlike the others, it was not locked, and I found myself within the room and upon its floor rather quickly. Once I was in the room, the yelling stopped completely. It was silent again, and I stood up to scan the room. It stretched a little over two stories tall, and metal crates were stacked in piles around the walls and in the center. Directly in the center was a disturbing set of tall male mannequins in varying types of tactical armor standing at the end of a shooting range. From the looks of the room as a whole, it appeared to be an old testing range that was converted into storage. The ceiling lights were on, but none of the first floor wall lights seemed to be operational. If this was an old military research and testing ground, the screams I heard most likely came from some test dummy stuffed away in a crate. There was a flight of stairs leading to a ring balcony that comprised the second floor, and from the looks of it, there was an old interfloor communication relay in the upper corner of the room. From my position on the first floor, I headed over to the stairs. The loud clang of my footfalls on the metal greatly contrasted the heavy silence that seemed as much a part of the room as the warm, stale air. Halfway up the stairs, the ceiling lights flickered, and I halted my ascent to watch them do so. Upon reaching the final step, they flickered again, and I made my way over toward the relay. It was there, a few scant paces away from my destination, that the lights gave out entirely. No windows? No auxiliary lights resulted in the entire room becoming a black, gaseous patch around me. Seeing no alternative, I kept my course and continued again toward where I believed the relay to be, my footfalls sending metal vibrations through the dark room. 
After a few steps, I thought I heard something and stopped walking. A skittering noise, tiny scrapes and taps against the metal floor, scurried around me and then stopped. It went silent again as I stood still, listening for anything I could hear and recalling my wandering arms. After I heard nothing again and moved myself forward, my arms back out in front of me, behind me I heard it. A clicky clack any time I stepped, and it was not coming from me. I lifted my foot and placed it down to the ground as slowly and softly as possible as to make no noise. Click. I held my breath, but I could still hear breathing. The breath was soft but wheezy, and for a moment I thought I heard the clicking of teeth. I stepped again, and the click of it grew closer, the wheeze grew louder. For a brief moment my fear overcame me, and I turned about, my grasping arms in the dark still flailing about, and I touched it. I fumbled and crashed, fleeing my way back toward the stairs. Whatever it was that I touched dashed away, but now, out of sync with my steps in the dark, I could hear it. It ran about me, wide circles growing smaller and smaller as it skittered in the dark. What I touched was large. It was not some small little thing, but in fact, large enough to be touched by my hand straight out in front of me. The wheezing was so clear now and so much louder and approaching, but I was at the first step and gripped the rails as I vaulted myself down several steps at a time. My feet slid out from beneath me, glancing off the edge of a stair in the pitch black and casting me down the stairs in a heap. My rolling heap was thankfully faster than the skittering, and I reached the bottom of the stairs fairly quickly. Having landed on my arm, my wrist burned with pain as I stood up and tried to rush a feeling path to the door from which I came. I reached out and felt, recoiling in surprise and fear, but the mannequin didn't move. I composed myself and set out toward the door again, lost within the maze of crates. The skittering was close upon me now. Every time I moved, the thing moved with me, and I could hear it dash from my left to my right on the metal floor. At the edge of my vision, I could see a sliver of light coming from beneath the door, and it gleamed like a beacon in my frightened and overwhelmed mind. Turning towards the light, I felt air brush by me as the thing in the darkness moved terrifyingly close to me. It could so easily catch up to me. Why not just grab me? It skittered away. But as I grew closer to the door, its horrible noise told me it was right upon me again. Within reach of the frame, I stretched out towards it, but the hand in the dark grasped my clothing, attempting to rip me back into the dark. Its grip settled on the hard corners of my data pad, and to free myself, I unclipped it, sending the unseen force rolling back with a clatter. This brief victory invigorated me, and I reached the door, swinging it open and tumbling out. I could hear it approaching, so quickly this time, and closed the door as fast as possible. As I pressed my weight against it, a large crash shook the door and momentarily threw me off balance. Repositioned and ready, the crashes came in volleys and were paired with skittering and tapping against the back of the door. Whatever it was tried to get through. Whether or not freedom or I was the target, I cannot say. Between volleys and clicks, I heard a soft, mechanized buzz I at first didn't recognize. But as my eyes scanned the small hallway for any source of aid, I set my gaze upon the elevator. The noise I had heard was the elevator activating and moving, hopefully soon into position on my floor. I waited for the end of a volley and leapt forth for my cart, yanking it back to the door with me and placing it in tandem with my weight before it. The cart shook and the objects I tried to protect before fell to the floor with all manner of termination sure sounds. A ding. This was it. The elevator doors began to slide open, and I waited for them to reach their full width. As the crashing and clicking sounds lulled, new sounds of wheezing howls and laughing poured out under the door. The lull was all I needed, and I set my feet to flee across the small hallway and into the open elevator. I reached it just as the doors began to close, and crashed my back against the back of the elevator as I dashed in at full speed. Facing out of the closing doors, I saw the volley begin again, and the great door pushed open slightly, cascading my cart of breakables across the floor. 
Another volley. It opened more. The gap in the elevator door grew smaller, and with the final volley, I could see the door swing open as the lights in the hallway popped and died. Ding. The closed, lighted elevator was on its way. The soft, mechanical whir, unknowing of the horror it just replaced. The door opened to an empty elevator lobby, and I jumped out of the elevator, one leg in the door to stop it from closing behind me again. The buttons were there, as were the floor indicator signs. I was on floor 12. I took my leg out of the door and let the elevator leave. Several days later, after my short suspension without pay due to the unexplained loss of materials and an investigation into their whereabouts that led nowhere, I ran into Octavia. Festus, why do you keep leaving me such weird messages? Is this a prank? To make me feel bad about saying this place unsettles me? She looked cross and held her data pad in her hand. What? No, I haven't sent you anything. I mean, I sent you that one. She cut my rambling off and pushed the data pad at me. She tapped the screen and a recording played. Clicking. Tapping. Wheezing. Thank you for listening to the Liberty Podcast. Episode 5 of Tales from the Tower. Floor None was written by Caitlin Statz and was read by Sean Francis with accompanying voices by Caitlin Statz. The music and sounds were designed by Careless Chuja and the introduction theme was performed by Brandon Strader. For more information about the Liberty Kickstarter and to help bring Liberty Deception to life, please check out the link in the show notes or go to thelibertycomic.com and click the Kickstarter tab before it's too late. If you would like more information about the world of Atreus, please check out thelibertycomic.com, join our quarterly newsletter, or like and follow us on Facebook. You can also email questions and comments to thelibertycomic at gmail.com. This podcast is presented by the Nerdy Show Podcast Network. If you appreciate these broadcasts, please rate and review us on iTunes. To support the Nerdy Show Network and its presentations, please consider contributing to the Patreon at patreon.com slash nerdyshow and visiting nerdyshow.com for other works. This production is copyrighted 2016 by John Dossinger Publishing, and Liberty is a trademark of Travis Vengroff. Thank you for listening, and may the Archon watch over you. And that's this week's show and this season at the Sonic Society. I would like to thank every producer, writer, actor, editor, director of these great new shows and all we've been able to share. We've had a fantastic time this season. And I think it's only fair that we also thank you, Jack, for doing all of the production of the Sonic Society, the hosting, the pulling your hair out, the <laughs> you know, all of that kind of stuff. So well done to oh, you. Oh, my pleasure. And, and thank you. A huge thank you to, again to you, Mr. David All. I could not do it without you sir please please tell me and our listeners you'll be back next season to co-host you try and stop me <laughs> wonderful and of course a huge huge thank you to our listeners yes. where we'd be nowhere without you thank you for your feedback mm-hmm. for your interest for your new shows that you send us for the ones that you love and even the ones you don't love we like to hear from yes. all of those things and thank you to everyone who has sent us some little audio clips as well so thank you matt matt leong recently uh, and, um, yes. and i know that we've had other ones throughout the year for sure we'd love to hear back from you and matt also has done the odd audio drama we're hoping that he'll maybe continue that tradition Ooh, next yes, year definitely. maybe have a series for us matt that would be fun <laughs> Yes. You know, well, Sonic Society Season 12 begins in the first week of September, we have all kinds of exciting shows lined up in the meantime, including, of course, Sonic Summerstock Playhouse, and next week, Sonic Workshop, which we've been holding on to for a couple of months now. Yes. So much fun. Yes, looking forward to that. So find us all at Sonic Society Gmail, mm-hmm. and at Twitter at Sonic Society and Astro Tour 2010. Can we get you the Dave, David, like the real David Alt <laughs> now at this point? Or do, do you have any desire whatsoever to change your, your Twitter um, handle? It, you would probably lose all your fans well, and friends if we moved that's you. That's the trouble. I, I, I would like to, but uh, I've got business cards with that Twitter handle on now. Oh, okay. So it's one of those things I'm probably going to have to keep. <laughs> but I have toyed with the idea of David Alt VO or, or the real David Alt. Yes. Or the, that's a new one on me, there so I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> certainly have a look out for that. Well, um, maybe you should just instead go the other way and, and legally change your name to Astro Tour. Mr. Astro Tour. Yes. <laughs> Esquire. <laughs> 
<laughs> Don't forget to find us at the Facebook groups and the audio drama, radio drama lovers, including the Electric Vicuna Facebook group and the Electric Vicuna podcast, which is getting back up and running, too. Ah, excellent. Thanks to everybody yes. for a wonderful year. Thank you. Look forward yes. to see you next year. Absolutely. And we'll see you at the summer stock in just a bit. Good night. Good night. Sonic Society is written and produced weekly by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with original music by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews, and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society by Creative Commons Licensing. The Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Thanks for listening. This has been an Electric Vicuna production.